and thank you for joining us. I am Alan Archer, Assistant City Manager for Public Safety and Human Services. I know you're expecting our Mayor McKinley Price, and I'm sorry to disappoint you tonight. Mayor Price is the president of the African American Mayor's Association, and just a few days ago, he was asked to preside over a meeting between Vice President Kamala Harris, White House COVID-19 Coordinator Jeff Zients, Chair of the Biden-Harris COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, and mayors from across the country. Mayor Price is on the call now, advocating for an increased number of vaccines and voicing his support for the equitable distribution of the vaccine. Mayor Price apologizes that he can't join us for tonight's important discussion and asks me to please extend his appreciation to the panel and to each of you viewing at home or at work. Now we know there is a great deal of uncertainty, fear and frustration in the community right now due to the COVID vaccine and how it is being distributed throughout the community. The purpose of tonight's virtual event is to update you on what healthcare leaders are doing to ensure every person who wants a vaccine has access to one. I am joined tonight by Dr. Mike Dacey, President and Chief Operating Officer of Riverside Health System. Irene Farinello, Population Health Manager and Public Information Officer for the Virginia Peninsula Health District. And Jeff Johnson, Fire Chief for the City of Newport News. Our panelists will each provide a brief update and then respond to questions that you have emailed to us, as well as those in our Facebook feed. You can start posting questions now and keep them coming throughout the evening. We will not answer questions tonight about schools. Earlier this week, our superintendent, Dr. George Parker, shared the division's plans for students' return to in-person instruction. The timeline identifies target dates for bringing students back to school in two phases, beginning with student populations who are most in need of in-person instruction and support returning on February the 22nd. The next phase will bring back students whose families have opted for in-school learning. This in-person hybrid learning model will begin on March 8th. Please visit newportnewsschools.org for more information. So now let's get to tonight's topic, the COVID vaccine. Many of you have reached out asking when you can receive your vaccine and sharing your concerns about the distribution. I'm, not going to I'm now going to turn it over to Irene to discuss the Peninsula Health District's distribution plan. Thank you for the inv invitation and the chance to share the panel tonight with the significant partners in the response to COVID and distribution of the COVID vaccine here in Newport News. I'm hoping that by giving a very brief overview of the process we use for registration and uh, appointments for vaccinations and distribution that that will answer some of your questions in advance. If not, if your questions aren't answered, please call in, type them in so that we can address them. Step one for vaccination through the Peninsula Health District is to register with the Peninsula Health District on our website. There are four portholes or boxes labeled on the website. One is for 1A healthcare workers, one is for people over 65, one is for people 16 to 64 aged who may have an underlying medical condition, and one is for essential frontline workers, and that includes both public and private school teachers and child care providers. If you do not have internet access, you can use our vaccine call line, 757 uh, 594-7496. Newport News 311 has also graciously offered and is assisting callers to that number who may not have internet access. They will register you into the system. You can be assured that you are registered if you're working through 311. 
this is new, you will receive a confirmation that you are registered if, in fact, you have internet access. I do want to alert you to a change that is coming because this has all been about change. Virginia Department of Health is moving towards a centralized registration system. We're in the process of doing that this week. We're one of the pilots. And over the weekend, so Saturday through Monday, you will not be able to register online or by phone. It'll open up again Tuesday, hopefully to a brand new and much more user-friendly and responsive system. Step two, I'm sorry to say, is to wait. Here are some of the numbers. The vaccine allocation for the Peninsula Health District is 2,400 doses per week. We're hoping that will increase. We don't know when that will increase. The distribution is to the localities that we work with. Newport News is one of five. It also is distributed to certain pharmacies and some health care practices who have indicated the willingness to self-vaccinate their own staff and some of their patients. The distribution to other uh, sites, health care workers, also occurs through Riverside. This number is, that I'm referring to is the allocation for our whole district. The number that comes to Newport News, unfortunately, is not more than 500 or 600 per week. On the other side of the, the page, you'll see uh, an uh, indication of the health care workers who have registered. Health care workers who've registered has been a little over 13,000. But we have whittled that down, some of our own, much more by the Riverside Health System and their work with their health care providers and the, within their system. We also, at this time, have 13,000 people over the age of 65 registered. There are 62,000 of you in our district, but 35,000 of you have registered. We have about 2,000 people in the 16 to 64 category registered, and right now we have uh, about 2,000 private school teachers and child care providers. Although it doesn't make you feel any better, it doesn't help you know when you'll be vaccinated, I did want to share with you the numbers and, uh, and the reality of the problem of distribu distributing vaccination to this large of a group in, pop in this population. Once your wait is over, you, will, you can make an appointment. If you've registered through the internet with your email, you'll receive an invitation to, to schedule an appointment through the internet. If not, you'll be called by phone. The fact that your contact is by phone does not put you any lower on the list. Everybody is scheduled in the order in which they registered. There's a time stamp on every registration. I encourage you to keep your appointment. You might think that's a no-brainer. Uh, we thought it would be a no-brainer, but we've been somewhat surprised by the number of people who call and then ask to reschedule their appointment. We appreciate that this is, there are many aspects to your life, but I, we also want you to appreciate the effort it takes to appoint you, schedule you for an appointment, and hope that you will do everything you possibly can to make a keeping that appointment your priority. We want you to know that there is no residency test. We might ask, that is, if you live in Newport News or don't live in Newport News, we will not turn you away. Some sites will ask you for an ID because it just makes registration easier. My last name's Farinolo. It's much more easy for me to turn over my ID badge and have her type that out than for me to stay through my mask, I don't know how many times, F is in Frank, E-R-R, -R, et cetera. So you could be asked for your ID, but not for any type of exclusionary purpose, just to make registration easier. There's no charge or fee. There is, depending on your medical condition, a 15 or 30 minute observation, observation period, she's trying to say, after you actually receive your vaccination. And you will receive a card with the vaccination date and a, the target date for when you'll return for your second dose. And finally, keep your appointment for your second dose. Your protection is not complete without the second shot. If you traveled out of the county, the city, or the state for your first dose, you will be asked to return to that site for your second dose. We will try to accommodate you as much as you, we can, but given the current supply of vaccine, it's very important that people are vaccinated for their second shot where they received their first shot. That's a real brief summary of how things are working with us, and I look forward to your questions. 
Thank you, Irene. The Peninsula Health District partnered with the City of Newport News, Newport News Public Schools, York County, York County Public Schools, and Riverside Hospital System to vaccinate essential personnel and first responders at a temporary site at Christopher Newport University. This is an important step in ensuring the continuity of city government, protecting those on the front lines, and reopening schools. Riverside played a pivotal role in the success of our clinic. Dr. Mike Dacey with Riverside is now going to share some information on the vaccine and how they are distributing it throughout the community. Thanks very much and, and thanks for tuning in. Um, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about some parts of the vaccine that pe people have questions about. I guess the first thing to say is that for the first time in almost a year, uh, the, the news about the pandemic is getting better. Uh, certainly the vaccines are one uh, very important um, advance and honestly, a year ago, nobody felt that you have a vaccine right now. I mean, it's, been, it's happened very, very quickly. It's been a great scientific advance, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful accomplishment of all the researchers and the people that got the vaccine. Um, and also, important to understand that our, under, uh, our ability to treat patients who get COVID is so much better now than it was uh, a year ago. Uh, if you are unfortunate enough to get COVID and you're hospitalized, your chances of dying from COVID compared to the way it was uh, a year ago, they're down over 80%. And so a lot of advances have been made. I'm an intensive care physician, and, and a, lot, a lot of the ways in which we take care of COVID patients so much better now than, than it was a year ago. But the vaccines offer really, really tremendous uh, hope. And just to be um, just to be specific about it, uh, these vaccines are in incredibly, incredibly effective. They're the most effective vaccines in history. In history, uh, usually a good vaccine protects you about 50, 60 percent of the time. These vaccines protect you 95 percent of the time, and they protect you 100% of the time from getting really serious life-threatening disease. So they're tremendous vaccines. Um, and you know there are a number of manufacturers. One is Moderna, a company out of, uh, out of Massachusetts. The other is Pfizer. Um, both are equivalent vaccines in terms of their effectiveness and their safety. And when you look at the studies that were done in these vaccines, they, the initial studies, when you put them all together, studied all, over 100,000 people in a very carefully controlled way. And the side effects from these vaccines were extremely, extremely small. Now, it is true that you know, if you have a, a one in a million side effect, you know, that might not have shown up in terms of the uh, the studies. But even now, as we vaccinated 10 million, 20 million, 30 million people and more, uh, doing about a million and a half people um, a day now across the country, uh, the, the serious reactions from, uh, from these vaccines are somewhere along the lines of uh, four to five per million. So very, very uh, safe and effective vaccines. That's, that's very, uh, very important. Um, I think that um, when you look at the supply, as my, my colleague from the, from the health district said, um, the supply is currently the problem. But I'll give you some, some, some numbers in a second that I think provide some hope for that nationally. Um, but the supply to the state right now is about 105,000 per week. And the state is distributing that dependent upon the population. So I think here in Eastern Virginia, it's like 22% of the state's population. So we get 22% of the state's uh, vaccine. And that includes the entire Eastern portion of Virginia, all the way over to Virginia Beach. And so it's right. very significant uh, numbers of people. Um, there's hope that that will increase um, that allocation will increase starting next week to perhaps 120,000 or a little bit more if the federal uh, government is to be believed. So I think that's that's very that's very encouraging. Um, um, but it, but it certainly has been a, 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 a an effort that initially during the first couple of weeks, not just here but across the country, uh, you know it was it was difficult to get the vaccine out. But the good news is that particularly here in the in this portion of the state, um, we are only constrained by supply right now. Working with the people in the health, health district, uh, we developed a very efficient system. We've learned a lot from vaccinating and working with the, the fine people uh, in EMS and CDC 
state governments, uh, county governments, the healthcare workers. And so we've got a very efficient system, whether you get the vaccine through through the health district or through one, one of the health systems, Santara, Riverside, or, or, or a private medical group. Uh, the fact is it's the only thing that will slow things down is supply right now. Uh, so for example, at, at, at Riverside uh, today, we pass over 40,000 doses that we've administered to people. Um, most of those are, are healthcare workers and frontline city and county and uh, emergency medicine workers. Um, uh, but uh, 23,000 of those have been patients, uh, people at particular risk over age 75, over age 65 patients, people with pre-existing conditions. And we're focusing on trying to get the vaccine out as quickly as, uh, as possible. Um, you know, right now, it, to give a little bit of context to this, if you look at the nation as a whole, uh, the Moderna and Pfizer have produced and delivered about 60 million doses of vaccine. All right, 60 million doses for the whole whole country. Now, if you look, if you look, what's going to happen by April? They've they've agreed to produce and deliver, and they think they're going to be able to do this 140 million additional doses by say mid-April. And then if you look at this, there's a lot of discussion going on right now that the federal government is gonna buy additional vaccine and ramp up additional production of the vaccine. And they feel increasingly confident about being able to produce the vaccine, both companies. Um, and that would that would mean another, another 200 million doses sometime by, by mid-July. So that would be very encouraging. Uh, and then finally, there's a new, um, a new uh, company that's beginning to produce the vaccine and hopefully will get the vaccine, their vaccine approved uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. And that's Johnson & Johnson. And they, they may be able by midsummer to, pr to produce and, and deliver another 100 million vaccines. So right now we've only got 60 million that's been delivered, but you're talking about 140 million here, 200 million more, another 100 million. So there really is, in the coming weeks and months, going to be much more supply. And I think what we've learned over the course of the last, um, what is it, Chief, almost six weeks we've been given it? Six weeks. Um, we've learned how to give it very efficiently. It has to be handled just right because it requires a lot of ultra cold storage and it you only get six hours to administer certain certain types of vaccine depending upon who makes it. And so so it's um, it's we've learned a lot about being able to give the vaccine and we're increasingly confident of the ability to give it as quickly as we as we receive it. And that that that, that that's very hopeful. Uh, and the last thing is that a real plea to the people in underserved communities, particularly Latino people and African American people, you know, there's some some really um, concerning data about the fact that COVID is more likely to affect African American and Latino people, almost 40 or 50 percent more likely to 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 for those populations to actually get the virus, and twice, two and a half times more likely if you get it to be hospitalized and, and, and almost three times more likely if you're hospitalized to die. And that may be because people in, 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 in those populations and underserved communities don't have adequate access to health care. The medical problems uh, that they, they have pre-existing may not be as well treated. Whatever the reasons, it's very important that people in particularly the African-American and Latino uh, groups really, really need to get the vaccine because there are, seem to be a particular risk. And this is a national problem. But, but overall, we're very hopeful about what's going to come over the course of the next uh, next several months. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Dacey. And we uh, appreciate your leadership and all that Riverside and your team has done and continues to do during this pandemic. As Irene and Dr. Dacey shared, the Peninsula Health District is responsible for allocating and distributing the COVID vaccine throughout the community. While the city is not leading this effort, we play an important role in helping vaccinate our residents and essential personnel. Our fire chief, Jeff Johnson, has been working closely with the Peninsula Health District, and he is going to share some details on our clinic and the city's efforts during the pandemic. Jeff? Thank you, Alan, and good evening. Um, we are uh, really in the process of building some great relationships here on the peninsula between Christopher Newport University Riverside, City of Newport News Fire, the City of Newport News, Newport News School Districts, uh, York County School District, 
and York County along with the health district. Um, we've been able to collaborate uh, in conjunction with CNU to establish a clinic here located in Newport News in which we can effectively provide vaccinations of up to 21, 2200 people in a single day. Uh, it would not be possible without the partnership and Riverside has really stepped up and assisted us with the amount of doses that we've needed to get these clinic off the ground and running, providing pharmacists to make sure that the medicine's being drawn up. Um, York County Fire along with Newport News Fire, we have trained our paramedics and intermediate paramedics to draw, uh, be able to give the vaccine to do the shots. Um, and I'd be remiss if we didn't uh, recognize the hundreds of volunteers who have shown up for every day of the clinic to come in and help staff, many of them on their own time. One gentleman I met today said he came in to help volunteer because he was there last week for a shot and thought it was such a great process, he wanted to be part of it. None of this would be possible if it wasn't for the great cooperation and work of the group um, to do what's best in trying to get these vaccines in the arms. What we are doing there is we are giving vaccinations to the 1A, 1B, which is essentially the uh, public safety and frontline essential workers. And we're trying to get that in a very uh, cooperative manner. We're drawing numbers from each of those localities that I've mentioned, including school teachers, school nurses, to make sure that we are building a foundation to start getting our community back to norms. Um, the uh, the process is very simple, as you heard earlier from the health district. Um, we've got a link that's online, and people are able to register for the clinic. Uh, up to this point, it has been a, line, a link that has been sent out to the essential workers and frontline employees of any of those jurisdictions to sign up and get their vaccinations. Um, members will sign up, they'll get a registration, then they will show up to the to the clinic, and initially confirm their registration, then they go through a COVID screening to make sure that no one's exhibiting any signs or symptoms that would put anyone in the clinic at risk. Once that's been cleared, they move on down and to a final registration point to ensure all the information that they have listed for themselves um, because everyone getting a vaccine goes into the national database for this. So everyone's making sure the name, everything is correct. Contact information is very important, making sure that's correct. And then they are sent into the vaccination room. And uh, they're in our clinic, we've got set up 15 different vaccination tables where there's a vaccinator and then an assistant with them who takes uh, and confirms the lot numbers on the vaccine, confirms the location of the shot, and confirms who the person was that gave the vaccination. Um, there's a screening real quick that the, that the vaccinators will uh, go through to make sure uh, if you've had any prior side effects or any symptoms, those type of things, then we know whether you wait 15 minutes or 30 minutes, those type of things. Um, all of our vaccinators, again, as I said, are paramedics um, from Newport News Fire and York County Fire. And uh, they have volunteered, signed up, and on average, we have 15 a day. We also are utilizing school nurses from Newport News and uh, York County Schools to help provide those vaccines. So we're always ensuring that we've got a good staffing for vaccinators. Once the shot's been administered, person will then go into a, a small area where they will uh, wait for 15 minutes if they've had no previous uh, side effects from uh, either vaccinations like the flu or those type of things or any type of uh, anaphylactic type reactions, allergic reactions. If someone has had some of those reactions before or typically don't feel real well right after the flu shot, um, it's sore, um, they'd feel nauseated then sometimes we will hold them for 30 minutes and they go over into a little separate area. Um, that entire room is monitored by nurses, medical staff, and volunteers just observing to ensure that everyone is safe and uh, understand the process. After waiting their 15 or 30 minutes, they check out and they are completed and they go home. They get a date when they leave, uh, advising the first possible date for them to get their second shot. They will be notified by another email that will identify a date and time that's available and they can click on that and make their next appointments. And those will be going out sometime soon. So this whole process I've explained, um, believe it or not, has become so efficient that from walking into the door to getting out, including your 15 minute wait time or your 30 minute wait time is running somewhere between 20 to 25 minutes to about 40 minutes. It is that efficient. 
and it wouldn't be possible again without the partnership of the health district and Riverside really giving their staff to the freedom to come over and help work and the school district, just everyone coming together as a cooperation. And CNU has been so um, uh, diligent and uh, supportive in providing a facility and support staff to make sure that that clinic uh, area is clean and operating at all times at high efficiency, ready to go. And keep in mind, we maintain all of the normal COVID uh, precautions. We require everyone to have masks. We make sure when you're coming in the door, there's social distancing of six feet between people. That's why appointments are staggered to ensure we don't have a large line. Uh, your temperature checked, and you're asked multiple questions about COVID screening. So it is a very safe clinic to come into. It's very efficient. It's very effective. And uh, we've got a great partnership, and we are proud to uh, be rolling this out here in the Health District and in the Peninsula, and in particular Newport News at CNU with all of our partners. So um, we're very excited about this partnership we've built. It's effective. It's safe. And we're continuing to get more vaccines, and you've heard the more that are coming in the pipeline. So we'll continue to get vaccines out to our individuals. Yes. Yes. Well, Alan's going to do. I I want to um, just take a moment to to echo uh, what Jeff has shared with you. Uh, he makes it sound easy, and uh, nothing about this process is um, easy. But the reason that we have been successful here, and the governor during his uh, recent visit, uh, acknowledged uh, how well run our clinic was during his visit and has been is because of the partnership. Uh, you've heard uh, an emphasis on that word tonight, and that's for a reason. Uh, I couldn't be prouder of the team that we have assembled to take on this challenge. And it just didn't begin uh, with this clinic. We have all been uh, on the front line uh, figuring out together uh, how we can strategize and position our community to be uh, safe and to receive, in this case, the vaccine that is needed uh, for everyone to remain safe uh, and feel as though uh, they are getting the kind of care and attention that they need in this community. Uh, and it started with the pandemic outbreak and all of the planning that went into assuring that this community uh, could uh, practice all of the necessary practices and remain safe. I just want to share with you that that partnership has continued and we couldn't be prouder of all the partners uh, throughout this region that have come together to position us to be in this very place at this time so that we are ready to receive additional vaccine and push it out to the community as soon as we can. Now it's time to take your questions from our residents. Sarah Bowman from our communications department is going to share the questions you've posted on Facebook, as well as the ones that you emailed prior to tonight's event. Sarah? Thank you, Alan. So Irene, we have received a number of emails that were very similar, and I'm gonna read just a brief one to you, and if you could respond when, it's, when I'm done. Um, but this one is from Patricia, a Newport News resident. Um, I understand there is a limited amount of vaccine and health and essential personnel and elderly and compromised individuals need to be first in line and receive it as soon as possible. I don't mind waiting patiently for my turn, but I want to make sure I'm in line and make sure I'm in the right line. I filled out the online sign-up form with the Peninsula Health District. I received an email saying my information had been received. I am 69 and healthy. My last name begins with the letter V. So her question is, can anyone give her an estimate of how long it will be until she gets notified? And then how will people know when and how to register? I don't know when you registered, but right now at this current vaccine supply, the wait between registration and notification for an appointment can be as long as four to five weeks. You will, re if you registered via email, you will receive an email notification that will include some options for your appointment. That is, you'll receive perhaps a list of four or five in a uh, times in a row, and you can select 
self-select that. You'll push a button, your name will be prop, uh, filled in, and that's your appointment date. You'll get a confirmation for that as well. So you'll know that it's happened, that you pushed the right button and it went through and it worked. If you, um, if you registered through phone because you don't have an internet, we have one more wonderful partner, uh, folks from the Medical Reserve Corps who staff our call center and make phone calls. I can't tell you how many phone calls every day to appoint the people who need to be notified by phone. So the I I I understand how um, frustrating it is and some feeling somewhat like your your registrations out in a void somewhere. But we do have it. We're appointing people in the order in which they registered. But the wait time right now, if vaccine level doesn't go up, is about four to five weeks from your registration date. Thank you, Irene. Um, can you explain why Tidewater Physicians Multi-Specialty Group, TPMG, has been left out of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution? Well, the, the fact of the matter is that they have received vaccine from Peninsula Health Department, about 600 doses right now. Now that is a drop in the bucket. This is, as, as we've all been saying, it's about supply. This is all driven by vaccine supply. They have over 18,000 patients who are over the age of 65. So that 60 doses, 600 doses would not have gone very far into the folks in their practice at higher risk. As vaccine becomes available, those medical uh, Practices that are not associated with one of our health systems will receive vaccine as fast as we can give it out. In fact, that's the better way for it to be delivered, and we recognize that because those folks are already in their patients and are in their um, uh, records and are known to them uh, and can more easily be reached by them than we can, sometimes through their electronic chart. Dr. Dacey. We've heard a great deal about Riverside patients being vaccinated. Um, will you be opening your clinics to the general public? Yeah, so what we're doing right now is uh, starting today, we've, we've increased the ability to schedule an appointment, all dependent upon supply, to anybody who's been seen at Riverside over the last over the last 12 months. So for example, to, uh, with respect to the Tidewater Group, that would include over 10,000 people in the Tidewater Group. Now. Remember what we said about supply. You know, so supply is the real is the real dependent, uh, the real critical uh, issue here. So when you look at all the patient patients that we've opened up appointments to be scheduled for as of today, it's 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 approaching a hundred thousand people. And as we said, the the um, the the supply of the vaccine for the area is only two thousand a week right now. Now as that may you know, a month from now, that number could be 10,000 a week if, if, if supply goes up. So we're really opening up to be able to schedule people now that the healthcare workers and the frontline essential workers have been, have had the opportunity to receive the vaccine. The other thing that we'll be doing relative to what I said before in terms of uh, uh, underserved uh, people uh, in, in underserved communities uh, is we're working with the health district to try and have specific outreach to those groups of people who really are particularly vulnerable. And so we'll be having direct specific outreach and we may do some, some vaccine clinics. In fact, we are gonna do some vaccine clinics in some, some areas of Newport News that, that are particularly vulnerable. And we'll work with the health district to set those up over the course of the next uh, several weeks. Great, and once we have that information, we'll absolutely share it on the city's website and social media channels. And Dr. Dacey, back to you with another question we received. How long is the vaccine effective? Will we have to do this every year and go through this annually? So no one knows the answer to that question. Uh, it's, um, it's believed that likely is effective for approximately or, or at least a year, but that's an estimate. That's an estimate, and this is a, it's a new virus. The vaccines have been recently developed, and so we just don't have a lot of experience in terms of how long the immunity will last. But you know, the, the, the experts that I've read and, and listened to say it's, it's, it's at least a year, which gets to the question of, well, will, will you need a vaccine uh, every year like you need an influenza vaccine? And I think the, the sense is that there will need to be follow-up vaccines given, whether it will need to be every year or every other year, we're not sure. 
or a lot of these new mutations you might have heard about um, speak to the fact that the next version of the vaccine probably has to be modified a little bit. The current vaccines are, are still quite effective against the, the British variant and the Brazilian strain and the, even the South African strain. But, um, but there's likely going to need to be vaccines, if not every year, uh, at least every other year from what I've, I, I understand. Thank you. And Irene, another question for you. This is from Facebook. Steph says she used the Google Forms to sign up a few weeks ago and never received a confirmation email. So she resubmitted the Google Form this week. Was there a glitch previously or did her first information, and we did receive this via email as well. So if people did not receive a confirmation email, does that mean that their first attempt didn't work? No, no, it doesn't. I when we first set up the system, we did not put in a response. So for folks who registered the last week of December and through the middle of January, maybe even into the 20th, I'm trying to think when we added it, but for the first weeks of the, the system, you would not receive a confirmation. And it was calls like, I think it was Steph? Yes. Calls like Steph or emails like Steph that... Um, learned us. <laughs> and so we added that response to the system. So the fact that she did not receive a response does not mean she didn't get, she wasn't registered. On the other hand, the fact that she did again doesn't mean she's lower on the list. We would always use the registration that's the earliest. And it's okay if there's two. We have folks who have four, five, six, because they just want to make sure. And we appreciate that. Chief. Cecilia on Facebook said she received the first Moderna vaccine at the clinic. She was she said it was well organized um, and she received a card indicating a date of February 26th to receive the second dose. Um, you already mentioned this in your remarks, but could you just reiterate how will people be notified if they received the vaccine at the clinic when it's time to go back? Everyone that's come through the clinic and got their first dose and their card and has the date on it, we have their information. They will be sent a link. And so if her date is, uh, say it's the 21st or 27th of February, that uh, she's eligible to come back, there'll be a link that will come, and that'll be the first date that will be an option for her to look at. And so individuals will get this email, click on the link, and it'll show various days from that day going forward and provide times, and they can then select from a day and time that they want to come for their second vaccine. So it's fairly simple. The, first, the way they got the link the first time, they'll get it again. Um, through email and be notified of that. Dr. Dacey, this goes along with the vaccine. So after people receive their first or second dose, do they still need to wear a mask? And after they get the second dose, can they hang out with people, get back in groups and gather with friends? Nah, it's 2021 wouldn't be that easy. You know, <laughs> it's um, supposed to be getting easier. No, and, and the reason is because such a small percentage of the population has gotten the vaccine. So if, if you look at overall, I think in Virginia, it's, it's a little bit over 10% of the population has gotten at least one dose. Um, you really got to get up to 70 or 80% before you have what they call population immunity. And the other thing is, we know the vaccines prevent disease very, very reliably, but they may not prevent you from actually carrying the virus and give it to someone else who hasn't been vaccinated. So for that reason, um, it's, you really still have to wear the mask, social distancing, all the things that, that, that you've heard, because, it's, because such a small percentage of the population has actually gotten the vaccine. And staying with you and the topic of masks, it was announced that CDC research found that tightly fitting masks or doubling up with both cloth and surgical masks could reduce coronavirus transmission by up to 96.5%. So should we double mask now? Yeah, you know, my spouse is a physician, and we argue about this all the time. I mean, I wear one mask, um, she wears two. I mean, I, I, I think that there are a couple of things. The, the study you're talking about was, was released today. It wasn't so much a study as a, as a, as a demonstration. They took mannequins and, and figured out how many, were, were two masks more effective at preventing droplet you know, droplets coming out through the mask, and intuitively it is, it is more effective. Um, but most importantly, people need to be wearing at least one mask. That's, that's the important thing to start with. And if you're so uncomfortable with two masks that you end up taking it off, that doesn't help at all. So uh, I think, yes, it likely if I were, um, say I was going to, you know, get on an airplane and go across the country, I probably would wear two masks, you know, uh, or if, um, 
uh, if I were particularly vulnerable. Uh, but the important thing is to wear a mask. That's, 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 that's the most important thing. There's a sense that these kinds of masks, the surgical type masks, probably are, are more, they are more effective than the cloth masks and the N95 masks that uh, you can buy online. Uh, they're a little expensive. They're about $5 a piece now. They used to be 50 cents a year ago, no word of a lie. Um, the N95 masks are the most effective masks uh, of all. But long-winded way of answering your question, yeah, it probably is more effective, but you have to wear both masks. You're better off wearing one than taking two masks off. Thank you. Irene, is the Peninsula Health District going to open up mass vaccination clinics for people in Group 1B who are 65 and older? As soon as there's enough vaccine to do that, we certainly will. We're, I, would, I anticipate the system re still relying on appointments and just to control the crowd or the mass when we do are able to have very large events. But uh, again, it, it, it depends on um, the vaccine supply. I, I'm old enough to remember sugar cube distribution and lines at the elementary school. And I look forward to the day when giving the vaccine uh, vaccination is just as simple and straightforward as that without so much uh, paperwork, follow-up, whatever, that it's a more straightforward process. But we're not there yet and won't be until there's really widespread supply of vaccine. Thank you. And this message or email came in for Chief Johnson, but it really could be addressed to anyone if, if whomever wants to respond. If I received a Moderna vaccine at the clinic, at CNU, or wherever else, will my second dose be a Moderna vaccine? I, I can go ahead and answer that. Um, yes, um, absolutely. Um, it's been one of the recommendations early on, and we tell everyone that comes through the vaccination clinics that whatever type of uh, vaccine you get your second dose needs to be that same vaccine so if you're getting Moderna your second dose will be Moderna if it's first dose is Pfizer your second dose will be Pfizer we don't want you mixing them up and so that is what's important about the ID cards that we give everyone the registration card and it's got the lot number it also says whether it's a Pfizer or Moderna so as, as vaccinators as clinic operators as people are coming in we are checking to make sure which uh, product, which vaccine you received, and make sure you get the right one. So yes, you absolutely want to get the same one for your second shot. And speaking of the second shot, um, Irene, can you talk about how people who receive the first, first vaccine, how confident they should be that the supply will be there for the second vaccine? I, they can be as confident as you can be about anything right now, but I will tell you that all the planning for the clinic the first shot clinics always was done with the amount of supply we would need to be able to pr be sure that we could provide that second shot no matter where they received it. So I, we are just moving into the realm of second shot um, from where we started and whether it was Pfizer or Moderna, whether we're four to three weeks out. And our supply that we'll receive next week is much higher not that number I gave, that's still the first shot, but we have sufficient supply to start providing the second shot. That was a formula that a greater mind than mine figured out before we launched the whole vaccination program. And one important point about that is that it's, um, if you're off a little bit, if it's a few days in either direction or even a week, I, 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 that likely does not make any difference at all. Um, the important thing is to get the second dose because that gets you above the 90% uh, effectiveness. And that was one of the questions we received is if we miss the exact yeah. window, is it null and void and we have no, to start over? No, actually, there's, there's, there's a little bit of evidence that if, mm. I th if you go a week or two later, it might even be more effective. So, um, but the recommendation is, I think, three weeks, from five, three, three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks apart for Moderna. Yeah. And staying with you, Dr. Dacey, we've heard from people who are concerned about receiving the vaccine. Um, we've heard about people having side effects and, and other things. Um, is it safe? Oh, no, it's a very, very, very safe vaccine. Um, you know, certainly as you get into the 
30 or 40 or 50 million shots that are given, you'll find the rare side effect to that, that comes up that wasn't picked up in the studies. But it, it, it's a very, very safe vaccine, uh, and it's, um, you know, the, the one thing people notice is it's a more painful uh, injection than an ordinary flu vaccine. Uh, it tends to, the next day, tends to be a little more painful, um, but, uh, but it's an extremely safe vaccine. And if someone has COVID or has had it in the past, can they get the vaccine? Do they have to wait? Yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't get the vaccine when you have active COVID. Um, the recommendations are that you should wait approximately 90 days after recovering from COVID before you get the vaccine. But you should get the vaccine even if you've had COVID. There's a lot, lot of growing evidence that the vaccine is much more effective than having had COVID at preventing uh, the, you know, the infection. And one more for you right now. Um, does a vaccinated person present a risk to unvaccinated family members in the same house? No, no. Okay, that was easy, thank you. <laughs> um, Chief, what safety protocols are in place at the clinics that would be replicated at future clinics? So I think, um, as we spoke about earlier, it absolutely um, the screening process for COVID <clears throat> ensuring that um, when someone arrives at that appointment time that we do a screening for them to ensure that uh, that they are not um, showing signs or symptoms of being a positive COVID patient. Um, so coming in, making sure safety-wise that screening is done, making sure that we're doing temperature checks to make sure the body temperature is in the right range and not showing a, a uh, temperature a little over 100 uh, we want to make sure that uh, everyone is wearing a mask. We have hand sanitizer all throughout the locations, and we have individuals, as I mentioned, we have a lot of volunteers that are there to help out. Every, I'm going to call it a touch point or place that individuals are coming through for the clinic is wiped down on a regular basis. Some of those items are wiped down after each use. Chairs, tables, where individuals are getting their vaccine, uh, cards, um, there's a lot of items that honestly when we started working through the first day of the clinic it's like okay we need to make sure someone's doing this and we, someone's doing that and uh, fortunately we've been able to really catalog everything is is what we think so if another clinic stands up we can hand this manual over and it says here's how we believe we run a very successful uh, process and so um, lots of safety measures are in place to uh, protect individuals for the covid potential exposures, just to make sure it's a very clean, safe, uh, and efficient clinic. Thank you. And Irene, when will people in 1B who are under 65, but they have high health issues, when will they be able to receive the vaccine? Well, that group is in our mix now. The three 1B groups that we're focused on are the those who are over 65, those who are 16 to 64 with underlying medical conditions and school teachers, public or private. We've had some concerns from private school teachers that they're not included in 1B, but that's not the case. They are just an important part as the other 1B groups and then child care providers. Until we have vaccinated all the 1A, and um, we've, we've got a lot of help from our Riverside partner with that, but until that group has been, that list is exhausted, we will continue to schedule 50% of our slots to 1A, and then the other amongst the 1B groups. So we are vaccinating some of the 1B, but, and hopefully very soon, I would hope by the end of March is Dr. Dwamena, our director's goal, is that we will work through, not the end of March, strike that, by the end of February, we have worked, we will have worked our way through the 1A group. And so everyone we will be scheduling will be in the 1B. And Catherine on Facebook is asking, will York County and Pocosin residents have the opportunity to go to the CNU clinic or will there be a site opening somewhere else in Newport News or in the county? Um, who on the panel would like to address that? I can jump in. And, and I now add. I'm sure one of the others maybe will add. So at this point, um, we are working through at the CNU clinic. It is Newport News uh, schools, Newport News city employees, 
York County schools, York County employees, CNU uh, employees. Um, right now, that is what we consider a closed pod, so we're working through those employees. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now. The CNU um, location has been very effective, very well uh, run and set up. And so <clears throat> we're encouraging, and hopefully it will work out, that we will remain there and be able to take um, other residents. But we got to keep in mind, as a working university, and that may not be uh, an achievable a goal to maintain there. So at this time, the City of Newport News and several uh, other agencies are um, working on plans for additional location that we could stand up or move the move the uh, vaccination clinic from CNU to another location. Um, once we have reached where we are open up to the general public and the one A's one or sorry the one B's and on, then yes, either of those would be eligible to go in to the Peninsula District, click the link, sign up for their appointment time, and then visit any of the clinics. So, I believe so. And I wanted to add that we do have a, a much smaller site uh, compared to CNU at the Senior Center in York County, which is in Washington Square Shopping Center. Most of the seniors we've scheduled have been have received their vaccinations there. It's not limited to York. So, the, is, again, we just go down the list in the order people registered. But that is a smaller site that we're seeing more 1Bs than anyone else. And getting the vaccine to our vulnerable populations is essential, um, including those who don't have access to reliable transportation. Um, Dr. Dacey, you spoke about how you're trying, Riverside is trying to set up clinics um, in these areas. Can you just reiterate what you're doing in that aspect? Yeah, so we just had a, a in fact, a, a good meeting about that today. And uh, we're working with um, the Achievable Dream Campus. We're working with with a number of the free clinics, all in concert with the with the health department and, and the health district to try and set up those clinics in, in areas that are, that are more accessible to people in those communities. Uh, it, it'll be, um, probably a, a couple of weeks before they're fully set up, but it is something that we're actively working on. Absolutely. You have to bring the vaccine to the people, not expect everyone to come to the central location. It, yeah, in the meantime, we have a number of partners who have stepped up and are helping us make sure that those folks are registered so that they're not missed when we do have an event. Uh, the CNI group with uh, HR CAP down in the East End is working with us and their residents to register folks. I just started a communication today with PACE uh, in, in no -go, in Nova, which now operates PACE, about um, folks who, seniors who may have challenges with transportation. Uh, the City of Newport News has a very vibrant Hispanic advisory group. We've started working with them to make sure that those who don't have English as a first language are registered. We want to make, my goal uh, as the population health manager is to make sure as many people are registered and known to us and in place so that when we can pull the trigger on these small clinics, we've got folks we can populate without any trouble. And that's so important. And if you could also reiterate that you don't have to be a citizen, correct? You, correct. These are free vaccines. We are federally. We are. We everybody is not. We are not permitted to ask about residency. That's just right out there. No, that's not a question you can ask. I only brought up the ID thing because I know that worries people. And then if we ask for an ID, it's like, well, why are you asking for that? And that really is just for the ease of registration. And Irene, you mentioned the York County Senior Center, and Catherine on Facebook asked, can a 1A, someone who falls into phase 1A, not affiliated with Riverside or Centera, go to the York County Senior Center to get the vaccine? Yes, but by appointment. How do they get an appointment? Are they registered with the health department? She did not put that in the message. We'll assume if that she is. If she's registered, if she isn't, please do. If she is, then uh, I have a lot of faith because of some things that are going on. We'll be able to get the 1As vaccinated through our allotment or gift vaccine, as we like to call uh, surprise supplies of vaccine from other sources, that we'll be able to do the 1As. But it's important that she's registered. Someone has to know how to get her onto a schedule. 
And someone, Jan on Facebook, asked a great question. So when the new Virginia-wide registration system comes online on Tuesday, will people have to register again, or will existing registrations be transferred in their current order? Oh, thank you, Jan. You just saved us a lot of worry and people a lot of frustration. No, you do not have to re-register. The registration that takes place either at our website or at the state website all, I, I don't know a better word, dumps into the same database. And the, those who register at the state site who are residents or who have addresses in our localities will be sent to us. So it's going to be a shared uh, database. So no, you do not have to register again. And we have heard from people on Facebook um, who Stephen's daughter is a nanny for a family. Um, how does she prove her child care role? And another person is a self-employed health care worker. So how do they prove their roles to get a vaccine? We've had this conversation, and if the other panelists have too, and right now we intend to use the honor system. <gasps> but <laughs> if you tell me you are self-employed, um, care, uh, uh, care provider. Uh, if you say to me that you are uh, a nanny, although I have a little bit with nanny, but anyway, because that's a more close. The thing with child care providers and teachers is they, like f essential frontline workers, are exposed to more people than someone who might be working in a um, in a closed environment in a home. But we're not telling anybody not to register. So by all means, register his daughter, was it? Yes. Yeah. Have, have the daughter register. Best thing you can do is register. We'll sort it out. And on the registration, when it, it gets dumped into that big system, do you just take people in order of their registration or how do you sort through that list? It's, it's by order of registration. The only um, deviation from that some medical groups have registered with one point of contact and then have let us, and let us know, but we have 18 employees. So sometimes the way the schedule's configured, that person, uh, that point of con, we would see that, oh, wait, we have a block of 20. So we would send that person the point of contact, the block, and then they would fill it in. That might mm -hmm. jump over one person who, oh, I have 23, but we didn't have room for them, but they'll be the next ones in line. But we work very, very hard to make it as fair and uh, equitable and as we can possibly make it. And Dr. Dacey, we have heard from people, again, who are concerned about the vaccine. Could you share again what are the most common side effects and then also answer if someone doesn't have side effects, does that mean the vaccine didn't work? So to answer the second part first, no, um, people, people who don't have side effects, the vaccine is still working, no question. Um, most side effects are mild. The top three are pain at the injection site, mild fever, and chills, particularly more likely to happen after the second dose than the first dose. Thank you. And this is the last question, and I'm actually going to open it up. I'd like each panelist to respond. And Alan, I apologize that you haven't received any questions. I know you're probably glad to not have been in the hot seat. <laughs> um, but I'd like to start with you if we can. And if each panelist could answer, what do you say to people who are considering not getting the vaccine? Well, hopefully, for those who are trying to make that uh, decision, you've been able to hear from some of the experts uh, here tonight from our medical community. And uh, I really would encourage um, uh, anyone finding themselves in that position to talk to a medical expert. Uh, if they do have questions about the vaccine or they simply uh, don't understand or they're afraid, those are all legitimate concerns. Uh, you know, please seek out an authority uh, who can help you address those uh, 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 questions that you may have. And um, I would, would encourage, uh, again, anyone in that situation to find those uh, answers um, to, to questions that they have, and uh, certainly would encourage individuals uh, to uh, pursue uh, vaccination. I would second all those remarks. The best person to talk to is your primary care provider. If you don't have a primary care provider, please talk to someone, trusted uh, health care provider you may know in a friend way, you may know because of what their occupation is, but check with them, talk to them about 
the vaccination and share your honest fears with it uh, about getting the vaccination. I will tell you all that one thing we are finding even in our own work group, and we're the health department, that people who were vaccination reluctant, as they see more and more people receive the vaccine and survive and not have um, serious uh, side effects, then I then they step up and say, yeah, you know, maybe I will. So one of my hopes is that more as more and more people become vaccinated and have a positive story to tell, that those who are reluctant will decide to go ahead and be vaccinated because it is the best thing you can do for yourself and for the people you care about. Yeah, absolutely. It's it, you, This is the one vaccine. If you only get one vaccine in your lifetime, this is the one vaccine you want to get for sure. Uh, it's very safe. It's very effective. It helps protect both you and your family. So it's very important to get the vaccine. Absolutely. Well, I would say the worst part about being the fourth person yeah. is everyone has really said <laughs> a lot of the things that, that I absolutely agree with all of it. And, and I am very fortunate that I represent and work side by side with the men and women that are out there in the field every day that see the effects that this uh, yes. that this um, this infection has had on our community, the number of people that we transport every day, going to the various hospitals in our area for individuals that are not well that are COVID positive. Um, I think if member if there's individuals that are really not positive about getting the vaccine, if they saw that, or the number of deaths that have occurred from this, I think they really need to think about that because I agree with with the doc that um, if there's one thing you're gonna get, this should probably be it. I will tell you, it's an absolutely safe vaccine. I've had both uh, shots. Most of my men and women have had both shots. And I absolutely think that um, it's the right thing to do. It's the only way we're gonna solve this, uh, this pandemic and really get it back to normal life-wise uh, if, if, is, is to get the vaccine. So I echo everything else everyone's saying, but absolutely I would consider it, talk to your doctor, but I think it's the one that you would get. That's all the time we have tonight. Thank you to everyone who joined us. We couldn't get to every question, so we will post responses on the feed tomorrow. I know it's frustrating, especially when you see and hear of others getting the vaccine and you're ready for it to be your turn. I hope the information we shared tonight has helped and I encourage you to call the Peninsula Health District's vaccine call line at 757-594-7496. Assistance in English, Spanish, and other languages is available through the Virginia Health Department Call Center at 877-ASK-VDH3. The Commonwealth is investing in a significant expansion of call center capacity in the coming weeks, and it is working with local health districts to streamline the process. We'll also be sure that this information is available for you just as quickly as we can. Please continue to visit the city's website, nnva.gov coronavirus, for up-to-the-date information on the vaccine and the city's response to the coronavirus. There is a section on the website for the vaccine, and we hope to begin to populate it over the coming weeks as the Peninsula Health District expands their efforts. In the meantime, it's important that we each continue to wear a mask, avoid large gatherings, practice social distancing, and wash our hands frequently. So please remember, take care of yourselves, be kind to one another, and stay safe. Good night.